Hello, and welcome to SETI Live. I'm your host, Beth Johnson, communication specialist here at the SETI Institute. Thank you to all of our viewers from around the world for joining us today. Please let us know where you are watching from. Also, welcome to listeners on the podcast version of SETI Live, available on most podcast platforms. The documentary short Deep Sky takes viewers on a breathtaking journey through time and space, showcasing stunning imagery captured by JWST on the giant IMAX screen. Joining me today is director and filmmaker Nathaniel Kahn. Thank you for joining me today, Nathaniel. Uh, welcome in. Welcome to SETI Live. Thank you. Always be always always happy to be back with the, the SETI Institute. Yes. So this is obviously not your first uh, film, uh, but this one is a, is a little different from previous ones again. And so, what was the inspiration here? What what made you go? I want to make a documentary about JWST. The chance to make an IMAX movie. You don't pass that up. It's so exciting. And and specifically, uh, the images uh, coming down from JWST um, that are being beamed to us from the telescope, which is a million miles away from Earth, out at L2, four times further than the moon. Um, the images are so extraordinary, and the, the definition, the resolution of them is so incredible. Um, you just can't appreciate their scale, their you know, their importance, their resolution on a smartphone or or even on a giant TV screen. You got to see it really big. And IMAX, the opportunity to show that in IMAX really allows you to appreciate um, this incredible instrument that we've all paid for. This is uh, taxpayer dollars at work. We've we've all built this telescope and it was a it was quite the journey, but it's out there and it's working so beautifully. And it's just bringing this bringing us this, these amazing images. So the 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 inspiration to make the film was really the chance to bring the images to audiences at a scale that is uh, does them justice. How did it come about? Was did it come from you? Did it come from NASA? Did it come from IMAX? Was this where, where which direction did this start on, and what was the process to get it organized? Sure. Well, well, um, I've been following JWST for for you know more than five years, and um, and made another film called The Hunt for Planet B. Uh, that involves JWST and that that um, actually Jill Tarter, who is is mm -hmm. the, you know the great Jill Tarter, who's the who's the inspiration for the film Contact, uh, the, the the book Contact, the film Contact, and of course um, is a, a SETI you know a, a a key person in the SETI Institute is in that film, and that's very much about the dream behind this idea of looking for another planet, living planet out there among the stars, and we talk about JWST and the capabilities of it and the hopes mm -hmm. for it. But the telescope had not launched yet by the time we finished that film. So it's really about the dream um, of the telescope. And, and it's very much about the astronomers and the, the, the people involved in the, in the search for um, another living planet out there among the stars. Um, but this film is, is very different because it happened, of course, after the launch of the telescope. Um, and so it follows the, the story of, of, um, of JWST's journey to L2 and... Uh, what is what is being 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 back back to earth so the impetus comes from wanting to tell this uh, remarkable story um from the first couple of years of of the telescope's life so jwst only launched you know about about a year and a half ago what was the timeline for putting this film together um well the the the, the timeline really we put it together fairly quickly I, oh you were asking sort of how it all began so it, mm -hmm. it began by actually NASA um, putting putting IMAX and me together, um, which was uh, very, very uh, nice of them. They knew that I'd been documenting the telescope. So um, and of course, they also knew that they had these incredible images and um, they're, you know, very focused on making sure that people have access to these images. So the idea of, of putting us together just made sense. Um, and the timeline was pretty was was pretty quick. We actually began, oh, I guess it was about a year, a year and a half ago now, um, something like that, uh, put it, putting it together. So it came together fairly quickly, but I already had some material that I had, I had filmed. Um, and then, of course, the opportunity to work with these images um, helped greatly. And then I'm, and then uh, uh, NASA had some, some really terrific footage. Also, there's a wonderful camera crew at NASA that was mm -hmm. um, following aspects of it that that uh, no one was allowed access, uh, access to. So we had 
everybody has access to that footage, but we were able to up res it to a level that could be used at IMAX. So it's a, it's a combination of things, but um, very much focused on uh, the story of this incredible instrument. And really, as I say, focused on the, on the images and what they mean. Um, and they became, they really became the driver for the story, putting the images together and telling the story of how we think the universe began and how we got here and um, our current position, our current place of the search for, for life out there. Um, the images kind of told us which way to go with this story. So it evolved as we went because oh, images nice. kept, great images kept coming down and we had to revise the story as we went. That is, that's really fascinating. I'm going to take a second to welcome in people before we get back to this. Um, we have viewers joining us from the UK, California, New York, New Hampshire, uh, Germany, uh, Canada, England. So uh, yeah, we've got quite a few. And also a uh, rocketeer man says he's looking forward to it at this weekend at IMAX Los Angeles. So we've already Great. know we've got oh, one wonderful. person out there who's going. Very good. Oh, and yes, hello we from hope Greece. many people get to see it. So uh, it's 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 been out somewhat since October, but this weekend is sort of the big IMAX push. Uh, what are you all doing to sort of push this out and and show that it's it's coming out? And you know why should people go see it? Well, lots of things. I mean, the the film uh, we very much wanted to make a forty minute film because we wanted to have a film that could play in science centers. You know, part of the part of the reason for making the film was that we really want to provide access for younger people to learn this story, to know what's happening and to see the images. So the 40 minute mm -hmm. format uh, is perfect for the Science Center. Um, you know, it allows uh, student groups to come and families to come. Um, but to, uh, you know, to really reach people, there are only science, there, there should be way more science centers in the world, by the way, but um, there aren't science centers everywhere and there aren't IMAX screens everywhere um, in those science centers. So we wanted to do something uh, broader that would really allow more access. So um, working with IMAX's partners around the country, we were able to do this, this special one week um, engagement of showing the film in 300, more than 300 IMAX theaters around the US and Canada. Um, and the nice thing about this too is the timing of it, it's very much time for Earth Day because um, mm -hmm. Earth Day is coming up. And um, the important thing, I mean, obviously Earth Day is extremely important. We have only one planet. In spite of all the hundreds of billions that, are, that we now know are out there, there's only one living planet that we know in the entire universe, and that's ours. And we're not doing a very good job at taking care of it. So um, we, we felt somehow that this would be an appropriate uh, a weekend to begin the film, because mm -hmm. um, as much as it's about the, the universe and, and all the wonders that are out there, um, the film also brings us back very much to home, to here. Um, and the fact that, uh, that we only know at this time of one living planet in the entire universe, and that's ours. So we felt that maybe this, this kind of cosmic perspective of uh, this vast cosmic perspective that JWST gives us, helps us at this moment to think about our own little planet in, in a new way. On, on that note, what about making this documentary sort of uh, amazed, surprised, confused you? You know, what what were what were what did you go through like learning the science? Oh, so so many things. I mean, um, there's a, that's sort of a two part thing. One piece of it, of course, is just keeping up with the with the astronomy and and the science mm -hmm. that is happening. You know, as we speak, um, astronomy kind of, you know, when I was growing up, astronomy was all about chasing galaxies and mm -hmm. trying to figure out, you know, how old the universe was, how big the universe was. And it was still Earth-based astronomy, which, of course, is still ex extraordinarily important. And as you well know, from this, from the SETI standpoint, Earth-based astronomy is, is incredibly important. Absolutely. Um, and and we, we have to continue our Earth-based telescopes, and there are lots of reasons for that. But at some point, um, you know, we get this sort of space, th these, these space telescopes, and, and everything begins to change. So suddenly astronomy goes from just chasing galaxies to all of this new stuff. Um, and the thing that I had to keep up with, number one, was the field of exoplanets. So this mm -hmm. is a field that has just, just blossomed in the last 20 years, 
since we discovered the first exoplanet, which was really only a little more than 20 years ago. And suddenly we now know through the Kepler Space Telescope and uh, the TESS Space Telescope, and now um, the, the, you know, the newer space telescopes, the ones that are following up on those, those, those two instruments are really just kind of finding exoplanets. These new instruments like JWST are able to follow up on them. We now know that virtually every planet in the sky has at least one planet around it. And many of them like the Trappist system, which we talk about in the film, um, have multiple planets around them, other whole other solar systems that are out there. So, yeah. so um, we've gone from a kind of astronomy being sort of a, I don't want to call it a sleepy field, but it was, you know, it, it, it kind of had, was hitting a bit of a plateau to suddenly it just bursting with new life. And, you know, for years also when I was growing up, particle physics was where it was at. Nothing yes. against particle physics. It's very exciting. The Large Hadron Collider is great. But let's compare for a moment. The Large Hadron Collider was, was designed to certainly to look for the, the Higgs boson. It found mm -hmm. it. Um, it. So far, it hasn't found a whole lot of other new things. Compare that to instruments like JWST. Every day, mm -hmm. discovering yeah. new things out there that we don't understand, that we don't, you know, the idea that we're now seeing that the earliest galaxies in the universe seem way more formed and way more put together than we ever thought. Well, why is that? Why are we making stars and galaxies that are so formed so early in the universe? This is something new we got to try to you know, keep up with. So keeping up with the science, exoplanets and new cosmology um, discoveries has been you know, a lot. Then there's keeping up with the IMAX part of it. And I had to learn a lot of new technology to be able to um, make a film for IMAX. And that was, that was extremely exciting, extremely scary, very humbling. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, having made my first IMAX film, I, I um, you know, I don't want to go back. I, I, I want to keep <laughs> making, you know, big movies. It's very exciting. Fantastic. I, I am excited for you and I am excited to see this on IMAX. Uh, small computer screens don't, don't do this no. film justice, everybody. They, they um, really don't. They really don't. Yeah, no. you're right. You're right. Yes. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, so how you, there's, there's a lot of different scientists involved in this film. Uh, how yeah. did you uh, get all of that sort of put together and, and sorted out? And who did you all, who all did you talk to? It's a, it's a pretty extensive list, I think. Yes. Well, I mean, the, the, the great thing about it is that, that, um, you know, the people involved with something like the JWST uh, project, they're there because they love what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They're not there for the money. They're there because they have a great passion for the work. And I've made films before about artists. Um, uh, I've made films about, um, about, about uh, uh, musicians. Um, I'm sort of drawn to people who do things out of passion. Um, and the scientists in, in this film, and the scientists that I met that are part of this, this mission, you know, did not disappoint in that regard. So, uh, I mean, basically you, you just go to meet the people that are involved with the project and they're all super interesting and they're, and, and they're from so many different, different walks of life and so many different life experiences. And so it, it's, a, it's sort of a natural, um, it, it's, it's a beautiful community of a global community of people that it takes to build something like this. And I guess I would say that one of the, one of the, best things that came out of this whole experience for me was um, that, it, that a, watching a project like this come together gives me hope that it's possible for, for you know, we human beings um, who seem to have a terribly difficult time getting along. Uh, and there are so many, so many really difficult, intractable, terrible, tragic problems in the world today. And it's made even more tragic through the realization that it doesn't have to be that way. We, right. you know, we can solve these problems and we can learn to get along. And, and when, you know, we have to be able to listen to each other for one, we, we can't just, you know, have our own opinion and refuse to listen to someone else. And this community of scientists who build and operate an instrument like this are all about that. They're so willing to be wrong. They're so willing to say, you know, I didn't recognize that problem. You're right. We need to fix that. They're so willing to say, you know, I don't know how to do that. How, how do you do that? Um, right. And to see that kind of collaborative spirit globally 
people with enormously different sort of experience, human experiences, to see that kind of global um, cooperation, collaboration towards a, a very abstract goal of building an instrument to look to the beginning of time. <laughs> you know, that's a pretty, pretty out there thing to see that people were able to do that at this level with so many things that could have gone wrong really does give you hope that we can get our act together, it, you know, if we want to. We, we have to want to, but if we mm -hmm. want to, human beings are capable of extraordinary things. I like that message. I think that's, that's going to be the pull quote for this episode, folks, right there. Uh, <laughs> so what what's next for you? Are you already on the journey of another documentary? Where where are you uh, looking to to do your next work? I'm actually working on a, on a fiction project at the moment, which um, which which uh, I'm very excited about. Um, but I am very much also also um, looking to do another uh, another documentary project that that involves science. Mm -hmm. um, I, I find uh, this sort of moment that we're in, um, where technology and science and capability are all kind of coming together in this remarkable way in many different fields, not just astronomy, also in medicine, in microbiology, in, uh, in genetics. Um, we're, we're sort of on the verge of multiple, multiple breakthroughs uh, in, in, our, in, our, in our capabilities and in our understanding of kind of how we work and how the universe works. And it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very exciting time to be involved in making, um, you know, films that, in, that, involve, that involve science. Why do you feel, I mean, what, what, in, what motivates you to share science with, you know, the community in general? Um, I mean, I know what got me into it. What sort of, what was your motivation? What got you into saying, I really want people to know more about this kind of thing? Well, I mean, that's a fantastic question. I never really thought about that before. I, you know, I've always had a passion for science, but I do think there's something about the scientific method, the idea that curiosity is something, that not knowing things is not only um, an exciting thing, or not, it, it not only not a problem, it's also a really exciting thing. It's great mm -hmm. to say, I don't know the answer. Let me see if I can find out. Right. And, and that actually goes against the, the grain of a lot of what we see in, in the world today, which is that people are so, you know, I think it's a natural human tendency in a way to say, you know, I believe this, right. this is the way it is. And, and, you know, no matter what, this is how it has to be. And, you know, I was told this, this is what I was taught, you know, sort of received wisdom. And there is a comfort in that. Mm -hmm. But but it also it 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 prevents forward movement of 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 our whole sort of species and and you can't get over that you can't find out what's over the horizon if you're not willing to go <laughs> if someone says well i'll tell you what's over the horizon it's this that or the other thing and people over there are like this or like that you know and you accept that well that always always struck me as being limiting i i want to know for myself i want to go for right. myself i want to find out what it's actually like on you know the so-called other side of the world there are no sides to the world right it's all just one ball but you know people have a lot of opinions about how things might be or how people might be somewhere else but unless you go you simply can't know <laughs> so so I, I find that the idea of science is that that curiosity and not knowing is a great thing and mm -hmm. you pull it towards yourself and embrace it and say I don't know, let me go find out. Um, and I guess I would say that that seems like an attitude towards life that, um, that I can't do without. And that, <laughs> I, that, 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 that seems like um, something I, I would like to share with, with other people. Right. I'm going to take just a quick second to welcome more people in um, where we've got people watching from uh, Greece, Minnesota, the Azores, uh, Tunisia. Welcome in uh, Louisiana, Michigan, uh, Scotland, Ohio, uh, Venetia. Um, so, yeah, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. If you have questions for Nathaniel, feel free to put those in the comments. We are watching them. I have had a few questions, and, and there's definitely one that I want to address because I've seen it a couple times here. Um, 
uh, Indy is asking if there are any plans to take the film to the UK or, um, and other people are asking, is there, there are any plans to have this available outside the United States and Canada? Oh, very much so. We're working on that now. Um, we are thrilled by that question. Please, um, if you would forward any of those requests to me, um, that would be great because um, I'm, I'm working directly with IMAX to, to um, find, you know, to work on the ability to, to bring the film to, to other, to other play, to, you know, to lots of places. We, it is right. currently in, uh, it's in Australia currently. Um, it will soon be in, uh, in Toulouse in France. And we are looking into any number of other uh, venues um, around the world. So, so thank you for that question. And we very much want to, want to bring the film to you. <laughs> Again, very excited to see this on IMAX. Um, what, when you figure out your next project, I, I definitely want to know what it is. And, and sure. I, I know we've already talked about having a, another viewing night because we did that with uh, The Hunt for Planet B. Yes. Um, is, is this going to be something that, I, IMAX movies are tricky this way, but is this going to be something that will be available on DVD for us to attempt to watch on our smaller screens? Uh, it, eventually, yes. But I'm, I'm really pushing for, and I'm working with IMAX on this, we, we really want, this is part of the reason we've done this, this big release around the country. Um, it, this is really coming from the nature of the images themselves. They mm -hmm. really need to be seen very, very big. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd love to see this um, in sort of, you know, drive-in cinemas. I'd like to see it in, in, in big format sort of places, it, 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 lots of different big format places, because, because once you see these images big, something happens that you that you somehow feel con more connected to the cosmos it's not something you're looking at it's something you're in and that i mean ultimately that is that is the imax experience that you feel you're sort of falling into space you're feeling you're falling into these images and 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 space is especially strong in this regard i mean i remember going as a kid to you know the planetarium i'm from philadelphia and the planetarium that we had here was was really good and and uh, those star shows were, were so magical. Um, and I remember the first the first IMAX film that I saw, you know, to fly. We, we all saw it at the at the Museum of Air and, Air right. and Space Museum in Washington. And it was just this experience of being in the air, being in space. It, it it's physically transforming. So um, yes, this film will eventually be available in smaller formats. But I, I really encourage people to go see it in this big way it, it really is a very different movie that way it's it's yeah. it feels different and also ju just to be clear um the images themselves we use the images as they are from nasa we did um we asked for the highest quality we use a 16-bit color we use more color information and the imax process allows you to use more color information than, than most televisions have, or certainly than most broadcasts have. Um, so we are really like giving you the best of the best in the, in the, with the IMAX uh, process. And there is a whole a, a sort of process that is used, um, that, that IMAX uses to optimize the, the quality of the images, images on the screen that really does justice to what is, to actually what the telescope is doing, what it's giving mm -hmm. us. And the optical engineers who built the telescope um, you know, we're thrilled with it. And that makes me really happy because they're, they're tough critics. I mean, the, these, are, these are people who are able to make, just to give you a sense of just how accurate this instrument is that they have built. Um, the mirrors on JWST, there are 18 of them, they're hexagons. Um, and they're, you know, they're about approximately three feet across or so. If you were to take one of those mirrors Mm -hmm. and stretch it out to the size of the entire United States. So you make the mirror, you know, enormous. So you're magnifying any of the imperfections. There would be no hill or valley in that mirror bigger than two or three inches. It's that precise. It is the, it's optically so perfect because it is looking wow. for these, you know, these incredibly rare photons from the super early universe. And there aren't very many of them. So if one hits that mirror, you want to make sure it's bouncing in exactly the right direction to hit the secondary in exactly the right direction to come back and hit the detector because you can't mm -hmm. afford to lose a single photon. Um, 
you know, these optical engineers, at, people who built this thing are, you know, they're geniuses. So to have them say, you know, you, you did pretty good with the, with the pictures on the IMAX screen makes us really happy. That actually leads to um, two different questions from the same person. Uh, one, um, do, do we know if there have been any more uh, meteorite collisions with those mirrors and, and how much have, has that, Im I hate to say impacted, but how much has that impacted the ability of, of JWST to gather all these photons? Yeah, it's a it's a fantastic question. Whoever asked it, you know, you're 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 up on it, um, and you're certainly this is this is uh, something which um, the engineers and the operators of the telescope are very much looking at. Um, there are micrometeorites out there in space. Space is not totally empty. Certainly not, you know, in, in, in um, interplanetary space in our own solar system. It's pretty empty, but there's stuff, and and the telescope is traveling in an orbit. It's moving really fast, so a tiny grain. You know, those of you who know Newton's laws know that it has a certain amount of momentum, um, you know, which is, uh, 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 what is it? It forces the mass times the acceleration. So, you know, the, 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 a little object has a lot of force when it hits the mirror. So, so the, it has been dinged. Um, so far, it's within the parameters that have been expected. But, um, you know, there are some concerns and it's, it's knocked the mirrors here and there, but luckily we've been able to make adjustments to deal with it. Um, one thing that, that is happening is that the observing protocol where the telescope is pointing has been adjusted um, based on when we think there's going to be more or less debris in the path of the telescope. So ah, they are okay. very carefully thinking about where the telescope is pointing and are the mirrors exposed, more exposed or less exposed based on where it is in its, its orbit. Um, so it is a concern. Perhaps it will modify, you know, one of the key things to think about with this telescope is, and this goes to the heart of SETI too, we need to keep building bigger detectors. Yeah. You know, for those of you who are out there supporting the SETI Institute, I, I want to be, you know, clear. I'm, I, I love all this stuff. And as much as I am crazy about JWST, I'm crazy about the stuff that SETI does. And, you know, SETI needs more detectors, larger detectors, um, you know, more instruments to keep listening and keep looking for, for signals. Um, we need more and larger uh, telescopes in space to actually look for um, habitable planets or possible signs of life on Earth-like planets around sun-like oh. stars. We need to build another even bigger telescope, which instead of being infrared is optical. Um, so mm -hmm. those telescopes in the future, there may be some modifications to those designs based on what's been seen partly from the meteorite, um, the right. little tiny micrometeorite impacts. And we wanna be clear, these meteorites are not, they're really, really small. They're like the size no, they're, of- they're, you know, they're grains of sand, They're grain, they're, they're smaller than grains of sand. But yeah. because of the, you know, their their speed, they they have an impact on the mirrors. So, but right. those things were were considered, uh, you know, during the launch. And yes, it has some impact, but so far, it nothing nothing that's compromised the instrument in any way. Uh, thank you to Julia for the stars on Facebook. Much appreciated. Speaking of supporting us, uh, and. The other question that, that was asked was, what is the technical resolution of the IMAX images? What, what sort of resolution are we talking about in this film? Sure. Um, the, the, fil the film is, is, is basically 4K. Um, but some of the images, I mean, that's deceptive because it has to do with pixel size and pixel dimension. So, right. I, I, you know, it's not like a normal 4K. It's, it's modified by the IMAX technology of how IMAX optimizes the 4K-ness of it. So it, it, um, it's 4K, but it's 4K huge. So it retains 4K-ness at a really, really big scale. Many of, the, um, many of the images that we are using are more than 4K. So something like the Cosmic Cliffs, um, which is a, a key image, a magnificent image. It was actually on the cover of a number of newspapers when it first came down. Mm -hmm. um, and we spend quite a bit of time looking at that. And one of the sequences that I, that I really love is several of the astronomers at NASA sort of reacting to how they feel emotionally about seeing the cosmic cliffs. And it's, it's, a, it's a very emotional moment in the film. That image is actually 8K. So oh, wow. there are images in the film that are more than 4K, but it's 4K minimum. So, okay. 
And uh, as were you exposed to these images as they came in at some point? Did you have to, or, you know, did you get to be just as surprised with everybody else when they, they rolled in and, and you got to be one of the first people to go, oh my gosh, that's amazing? Uh, well, I mean, NASA is very, I mean, this, this is a, this is a, a, a highly fair institution. They don't, they don't, they don't favor anybody. So right. they weren't like sneaking images to me or anything like that. They, they don't do that. They release them. Um, so when you say, was I excited? I was excited, but also terrified tearing my, well, I don't have much hair, but tearing what little hair I have out because, um, because we were already structuring the film and suddenly some great new image would show up and we'd realize how can we not incorporate this? So my editors and I, we 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 tear the film apart again, rearrange things, put you know put an it put an image in where it wasn't before, and that would change the narration. That would change the you know the structure of the story. Um, and but I would say one of the great things about making documentaries, one of the one of the one of the really scary things about documentaries is they take a long time. So a lot of times you know, you're, you're, you're hanging it way out there without funding or, you know, whatever it is, because you, you know, new things are coming in that you want to, you want to incorporate. Um, and a lot of times that's uh, a big frustration, but it can be a big plus. And in this case, it was a big plus in the sense that during the production period, these new images were coming in and actually it made the story broader and, and more exciting because we were able to incorporate them. So in fact, there's one image that we incorporated the very last day we were making the film. <laughs> We'd already oh, no. locked the picture. We were doing the credit sequence and we were laying the whole thing down. And this image came down that um, for those of you who, who know the images, it's the one where they found a question mark in the sky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it looks like a question mark. I mean, it, it, it it is a question mark, but it's yeah. We've two we've we've shared it since our our logo is a, a question mark. So Perfect. yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So right, your logo is a question mark. So that image came down, and it was like we can't not have this in the film. It's the great cosmic question. We gotta have it. So it's actually in the film twice, and I I think that for for um for for school age people who go see it. If you find it once, you should get out of, uh, you know, cleanup or something like that. <laughs> and if you find it twice, you should get, you know, an automatic A on the next science, the next math test, you know. Um, nice. But it's but we we put it in the la very last day. So we were up to the up to the minute. We tried to incorporate as many images uh, that were coming down from JWST as possible. Well, Nathaniel, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very excited. Everybody, this is, is uh, the latest IMAX documentary called Deep Sky. It is uh, premiering in your local IMAX Science Center theater uh, this weekend. So if you have one nearby, go see it. I, I cannot say enough that this is gorgeous and I'm going to go see it and and definitely want to see it on the big screen because this is going to be amazing so um thank you nathaniel for telling us about this experience and and uh good luck on this this weekend <laughs> thank you keep doing and, your amazing work at seti thank you and uh we will have you back next time so uh keep thank us you. informed on what you are on what you're working on thank you to all of our viewers for joining us today for asking questions for your stars for your donations Reminder that we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, your money helps us run this program and keeps uh, keeps me talking to all these fabulous guests and doing all of this amazing work. So thank you for all of your support. Feel free to go to SETI.org slash give now, which is on your screen, and you can help support our work and uh, keep us bringing all of this science to you. And as, as Nathaniel said, it is important to communicate science with the world. So thank you again, Nathaniel. Thank you to IMAX. And uh, thank you to everybody for being here today. Have a great rest of the week, everyone.